Static waterhead refers to the height of a water body that produces a particular pressure, expressed in pound per square inch (psi) at the bottom of this water body. One foot static head is equal to 0.43 psi, or one psi is equal to 2.3 foot static head. The static pressure head is solely dependent upon the water height above the point where the measurement is taken. Therefore, the pressure measurements at the bottom of a 20 feet deep pond and a 20 feet vertical water pipe are identical. A building can be served either by a municipal water system or by a local well system. In the latter case, a pump is required to send the water from the well to the highest plumbing fixture and meet its minimum pressure requirement. Therefore, the rated pressure capacity of the pump must be at least the sum of the following pressures: a minimum flow pressure of the highest plumbing fixture, b pressure loss due to the static pressure head, c pressure loss due to the friction in the pipe and meter. Untreated water contains both dissolved and suspended particles. After treated by the municipal water treatment plant. The clean water is piped and pumped to water towers to elevate the water static head, ready to be used by homes and businesses. An upfeed system uses the pressure in water main to directly supply fixtures upwards. The pressure of the water delivered by the municipal supply system is normally more than 80 psi. This pressure is large enough to raise water up to eight to ten stories, and still retain desirable pressures at plumbing fixtures. For example, a ten-story building has a floor-to-floor -floor height of 12 feet. The static water head is 12 feet times 10 stories times 0.43 psi per foot, which is 52 psi. Assume a pressure of 15 psi. Is needed for a fixture on the top level, and the pressure loss due to friction through piping and meter is 10 psi. The required pressure at the base of the building is 52 plus 15 plus 10, which is 77 psi. This diagram shows an upfeed water supply system in which cold water is distributed under the pressure from a public water main. Hot water rises from the water heater on the first level to the upper level under the pressure from the cold water supply. For buildings more than eight to ten stories high, water may be pumped to one or more elevated storage tanks at the top of the building, from which pipes carry the water downward to each floor and to water heaters by gravity. As a variation of this configuration. A few lower levels may be supplied by an upfeed system under the pressure from a public main, while the remaining upper floors are served by a downfeed system. High-rise buildings may be divided into multiple zones, each served by a separate downfeed system. This table lists the minimum pressure required by common plumbing fixtures for them to work properly. The highest residential plumbing fixture pressure requirement is typically 20 psi for a temperature-controlled shower. Most other plumbing fixtures, such as bathtubs, dishwashers, sinks, and hose outlets, require a pressure of 8 psi. A fixture unit is equivalent to one cubic feet of water flowing in a one and a quarter pipe in one minute. Fixture unit is used for sizing both water supply and wastewater pipes. Different fixtures are rated for different fixture units based on the flow rate they require. The number of plumbing fixtures shall be determined according to the building's occupancy and the occupancy load, as shown in this table. Here is an example. Determine the minimum plumbing fixture counts for a theater. Which is Group A1 with 1,200 occupants. We assume 50% female and 50% male, so the occupancy load is 600 people each gender. For theaters, the number of water closets is one per 
125 males and one per 65 females. The number of lavatories is one per 200 people, regardless of gender. And the number of drinking fountains is one per 500 people, regardless of gender. When there is a fraction, when calculating fixture count, always round up. Piping materials for hot and cold water supply are listed in this table, except that PVC cannot be used for hot water. The piping materials that are commonly used in buildings include brass, copper, and PEX. Water hammer refers to the loud banging or knocking noise within water supply systems, as if the pipes are hit by a hammer. It is a result of sudden changes of water flow through water pipes. When a water movement is stopped with a sudden force or direction change, the pressure surge or thrust may cause the hammering noise and vibration in the pipes. Water hammer can be reduced by decreasing the water supply pressure with the pressure regulator or by installing water hammer arresters to minimize the shock. An arrestor has a chamber full of air that will compress when water goes into it. It arrests the noise by cushioning the water with air so that it will keep water quietly contained when it encounters a sudden stop. Water heaters with a storage tank are commonly used in homes. They feature an insulated tank, typically holding 30 to 50 gallons of water to heat either by gas or electricity and store the water till it is needed. These heaters have low initial costs and need less maintenance than the tankless counterparts. The drawbacks include higher energy bills and space need and shorter lifespan. Tankless, also known as on-demand water heaters, use gas or electric heating elements to rapidly heat water as it runs through a heat exchanger and deliver it directly to fixtures without storing it in the tank. They are more expensive to install, but can be 20 to 30 percent more energy efficient than tank heaters. Tankless heaters come in centralized and isolated systems. A centralized tankless heater serves the hot water needs for the whole home, whereas an isolated heater is installed near the point of use, such as a shower or a bathroom sink, so users can have instant hot water. The operation process for both systems is a hot water tap is turned on, water flows into the heater, a water flow sensor detects the flow, control panels ignites the heater, water circulates through the heat exchanger and gets heated. When the tap is turned off, the unit shuts down. In a direct or open loop system, water to be used in the building is directly circulated and heated in the solar collectors. This system is simple with higher efficiency, but water is subject to freezing and potential contamination. An indirect or closed-loop solar water heater circulates a fluid rather than the water to be consumed by building occupants. The collected heat is transferred to domestic water in a heat exchanger. Indirect solar water heaters typically cost more than direct systems, but they are more resistant to freezing that's popular in colder climates. Indirect systems require a pump to circulate the working fluid which consumes energy and needs maintenance. A thermal siphon system is a passive solar hot water system that relies on natural convection. Cold water is circulated through the collector and to the tank, which must be placed above the collector. As the water in the collector is heated, it expands and becomes lighter and rises naturally into the tank above. Gravity then pulls the heavier cold water down from the tank into the collector, causing a passive circulation by convection. A thermal siphon system requires neither a pump nor a controller. It is totally passive and thus cost-effective. Similar to direct collectors, this system is not suitable for a very cold climate. There are three types of water in buildings 
clear or white water is completely clean and potable. It comes through water piping from the municipal water treatment plant where it is treated. It is considered safe to drink and used for washing. Black water is from toilets, urinals, dishwashers, and kitchen sinks, which is rich in organic materials, nitrogen, and micronutrients. Black water is not suitable for reuse indoors after any treatment. Gray water, which comes from bath, showers, sinks, or washing machines, is contaminated or used water that does not contain sewage but may contain chemicals. It can be reused after treatment. The drain waste vent system in a building consists of three major components. The drains collect wastewater from plumbing fixtures. The plumbing stacks carry wastewater down to the house drain. The vent pipes remove or exhaust sewer gases and allow air to enter the system. DWV pipes can be made of cast iron, galvanized pipe, copper, or plastic, such as PVC. A plumbing stack is essentially a vertical drain pipe that takes in waste from the drains. Depending on the type of the waste, there are two kinds of stacks. Soil stacks are the drain pipes for black water from fixtures like toilets, urinals, kitchen sinks, and dishwashers. Waste stacks are the pipes that drain gray water from sinks, floor drains, water fountains, and wastewater that has not been soiled. There are three types of vent pipes in a plumbing system. A branch vent that connects individual fixture vents to either a vent stack or a stack vent. A vent stack is a vertical pipe parallel to the soil or waste stack to which each floor's branch vents are connected. A stack vent is the final portion of the waste soil stack above the highest fixture and extends through the roof. Sewer gas is a byproduct of the human waste breakdown process. Sewer gas may enter the space through the drain of a plumbing fixture if no measure is taken to prevent this from occurring. A P-trap can stop sewer gas from rising up from a drain by providing a water barrier in the trap to block the gas. However, P-traps will not work well without proper venting due to the siphon effect. The wastewater will pull the water in the P-trap down the drainage pipe. In this case, because no water stays in the trap, it does not function as intended. A vent pipe installed near the trap supplies air when wastewater goes down the pipe and thus breaks down the siphon effect so that water can stay in the P-trap and serve its purpose. Similar to water supply pipes that are rated for different fixture units, the sizing of drainage pipes is also based on their rated fixture units. These two tables show the drainage fixture units of common fixtures and a pipe sizing method. Rainwater falling on sloped roofs are typically drained by a gutter downspout system, although some sloped roofs only rely on drip edges without a gutter. To size the gutter and downspout, a building located in Raleigh, North Carolina is used as an example to demonstrate such a sizing process. The building has a projected roof area of 36 feet by 52 feet with a pitched roof shown in this section. A gutter with a 1 8 per foot slope and a downspout are proposed for each pitch. The first step is to determine the maximum 100 year, one hour rainfall at the project location. Design rainfall rates are established by the U.S. Weather Bureau and they are based on 100-year storm occurrence within one hour duration. This map shows the maximum 100-year, one hour rainfall of the central and eastern regions of the U.S. Raleigh, North Carolina is located in Wake County, which is identified here on the map. The location falls between the 3.5-inch and the 4-inch contour lines. To be conservative, 4-inch rainfall is selected to represent the worst-case scenario. 
The second step is to calculate the projected roof area for each gutter. As shown in the example, each gutter serves half of the total projected area, which is 52 times 36 and divided by 2, and the result is 936 square feet. The third step is to size the gutter. This table shows the gutter sizing data based on the rainfall rate, roof area, and gutter slope. The gutter slope in the example building is assumed at 1 8 per foot. Therefore, the gutter diameter is sized at 6 inches. The fourth step is to size the downspout. These two tables show the sizing of downspout in round section and in rectangular section. If a round downspout is selected for this example, its diameter is sized at 3 inches based on the roof area of 936 square feet and 4 inch rainfall. The first table can also be used to size the diameter of roof drains for flat roofs. There are three methods of draining a flat roof, roof drain, scupper, and gutter. We'll focus on the first two here. When designing a flat roof drainage system with the roof drains, a quarter inch per foot slope needs to be formed on a roof substrate to direct water to the drains of each zone. This gentle slope is often achieved by taper insulation cut into a pattern. For a large flat roof, structural deck is often sloped to meet the primary drainage requirement, and taper insulation is then used for forming the secondary slopes to direct water to the drains. At the center of each zone, such as this shaded area, a pair of drains are provided, a primary and a secondary drain. The primary system consists of roof drains and their piping. They either discharge to ground surface or to an underground municipal stormwater system. The secondary system, either scupper or overflow roof drain, ensures that if the primary drains are plugged or overloaded, the secondary system will handle the rainwater drainage to ensure safety. If overflow roof drains are used, they will have an independent piping system different from the primary and usually empty through an outlet installed at the base of the building visible to people. If a significant amount of water flows out of this outlet during a rain, it shows the potential issues with the primary drains. As a drainage device, a scupper is an outlet through a parapet wall or raised roof edge, typically lined with a sheet metal sleeve. It allows water runoff from the roof to leave the roof through this outlet into a downspout attached on the surface of the building. This table provides a method to size a scupper in terms of its length and head dimensions. The table is based on the 5 inch per hour rainfall rates. The data can be adjusted for any rainfall rates other than 5 inch per hour. For example, if this building is located in an area with a 4 inch per hour rainfall rate, the shaded area of 1800 square feet should be adjusted as 1800 times 4 divided by 5, which is reduced to 1440 square feet. Then according to the table, the proper size for the scupper can be 12 by 2, 6 by 3, or 4 by 4 inches.